T. Ray and I live just outside Sylvan, South Carolina, population 3,100. Peach stands in Baptist churches, that sums it up. At the entrance to the farm, we had a big wooden sign with Owens Peach Enterprises painted across it in the worst orange color you've ever seen. I hated that sign, but that sign was nothing compared with the giant peach perched atop a 60 foot pole besides the gate. Everyone at school referred to it as the Great Fanny, and I'm cleaning up the language. Its fleshy color, not to mention its crease down the middle, gave it the unmistakable appearance of a rear end. Rosaline said it was T-Ray's way of mooning the entire world. That was T-Ray. He didn't believe in some slumber parties or sock hops, which wasn't a big concern as I never got invited to them anyways. But he refused to drive me to town for football games, pep rallies, or beta club car watch washes, which were held on Saturdays. He did not care that I wore clothes I made for myself in home economics class, cotton print shirt waists with crooked zippers and skirts hanging below my knees, outfits only the Pentecostal girls wore. I might as well have worn a sign on my back. I am not popular and never will be. I needed all the help that fashion could give me, since no one, not a single person, had ever said, Lily, you are such a pretty child, except for Miss Jennings at church, and she was legally blind. I watched my reflection not only in the mirror, but in store windows and across the television when it wasn't on, trying to get a fix on my looks. My hair was black like my mother's, but basically a nest of cowlicks, and it worried me that I didn't have much of a chin. I kept thinking I'd grow one the same time my breasts came in, but it didn't work out that way. I had nice eyes, though, what you would call Sophia Loren eyes. But still, even the boys who wore their hair in ducktails, dripping with vitalis, and carried combs in their shirt pockets didn't seem attracted to me, and they were considered hard of. Matters below my neck had shaped up, not that I could show off that part. It was fashionable to wear cashmere twin sets and plaid kilt mid-thigh, but T-Ray said hell would be an ice rink before I went out like that. Did I want to end up pregnant like Bitsy Johnson, whose skirts barely covered her ass? How he knew about Bitsy is a mystery of life, but it was true about her skirts and true about the baby. An unfortunate coincidence is all it was. Rosaline knew less about fashion than T-Ray did. And when it was cold, God help me, Jesus, she made me go to school wearing long breeches under my Pentecostal dresses. There was nothing I hated worse than clumps of whispering girls who got quiet when I passed. I started picking scabs off my body, and when I didn't have any, gnawing the flesh around my fingernails till I was a bleeding wreck. I worried so much about how I looked and whether I was doing things right, I felt half of the time I was impersonating a girl instead of really being one. I. I had thought my real chance would come from going to the charm school at the women's club last spring, Friday afternoons for six weeks, but I got barred because I didn't have a mother, a grandmother, or even a measly aunt to present me in a white rose with a white rose at the closing ceremony. Rosaline doing it was against the rules. I'd cried till I threw up in the sink. You're charming enough, Rosaline had said, washing the vomit out of the sink basin. You don't need to go to some highfalutin school to get charm. I do so, I said. They teach everything. How to walk and pivot, what to do with your ankles when you sit in a chair, how to get into a car, pour tea, take off your gloves. Rosaline blew air from her lips. Good Lord, she said. Arrange flowers in a vase, talk to boys, tweeze your eyebrows, shave your legs, apply lipstick. What about vomit in a sink? They teach a charming way to do that? She asked. Sometimes I purely hated her. The morning after I woke T-Ray, Rosaline stood in the doorway of my room, watching me chase a bee with a mason jar. Her lip was rolled out so far I could see the little sunrise of pink inside her mouth. What are you doing with that jar? She said. I'm catching bees to show T-Ray. He thinks I'm making them up. Lord, give me strength. She'd been shelling butter beans on the porch, and sweat glistened on the pearls of her hair around her forehead. She pulled at the front of her dress, opening an air ray along her bosom, big and soft as couch pillows. The bee landed on the state map I kept tacked to the wall. 
I watched it walk along the coast of South Carolina on scenic Highway 17. I clamped the mouth of the jar against the wall, trapping it between Charleston and Georgetown. When I slid on the lid, it went into a tailspin, throwing itself against the glass over and over with pops and clicks, reminding me of the hail that sometimes landed on the windows. I'd made the jar as nice as I could with felty petals, fat with pollen, and more than enough nail holes in the lid to keep the bees from perishing, since for all I knew, people might come back one day as the very thing they killed. I brought the jar level with my nose. Come look at this thing fight, I said to Rosaline. When she stepped in the room, her scent floated out to me, dark and spicy like the snuff she packed inside her cheek. She held her small jug with its coin-sized mouth and a handle for a loop for her fing to finger through. I watched her press it along her chin, her lips fluted out like a flower, then spit a curl of black juice inside it. She stared at the bee and shook her head. If you get stung, don't come whining to me, she said, cause I ain't gonna care. That was a lie. I was the only one who knew that despite her sharp ways, her heart was more tender than a flower skin, and she loved me beyond reason. I hadn't known this until I was eight, and she brought me an Easter dyed biddy from the mercantile. I found it trembling in a corner of its pen, the color of purple grapes with sad little eyes that cast around for its mother. Rosaline let me bring it home, right into the living room, where I strewed a box of Quaker oats on the floor for it to eat, and she didn't raise a word of protest. The chick left dollops of violet streaked droppings all over the place, due, I suppose, to the dye soaking into its fragile system. We had just started to clean them up when T-Ray burst in, threatening to boil the chick for dinner and fire Rosaline for being an imbecile. He started to swoop at the biddy with his tractor grease hands, but Rosaline planted herself in front of him. There is worse things in this house than chicken shit, she said, and looked him up one side and down the other. You ain't touching that chick. His boots whispered, uncle, all the way down the hallway. I thought, she loves me. And it was such the first time such a far-fetched idea had occurred to me. Her age was a mystery, since she didn't possess a birth certificate. She would tell me she was born in 1909 or 1919, depending on how old she felt at the moment. She was sure about the place, McClellanville, South Carolina, where her mama had woven sweet grass baskets and sold them on the roadside. Like me selling peaches, I'd said to her. Not one thing like you selling peaches, she'd said back. You ain't got six children to feed from it. You've got six brothers and sisters? I thought of her as alone in the world except for me. I did have, but I don't know where one of them is. She'd thrown her husband out three years after they married for carousing. You put his brain in a bird, that bird would fly backwards, she liked to say. I often wondered what that bird would do with Rosaline's brain. I decided half the time it would drop shit on your head, and the other half it would sit on abandoned nests with its wings spread wide. I used to have daydreams in which she was white and married T-Ray, and became my real mare, mother. Other times, I was a black orphan she found in a cornfield and adopted. Once in a while, I had us living in a foreign country like New York, where she could adopt me, and we could both stay our natural color. My mother's name was Deborah. I thought that was the prettiest name I'd ever heard, even though T-Ray refused to speak it. If I said it, he acted like he might go straight to the kitchen and stab something. Once when I asked him when her birthday was and what cake icing she preferred, he told me to shut up. And when I asked him a second time, he picked up a jar of blackberry jelly and threw it against the kitchen cabinet. We have blue stains to this day. I did manage to get a few scraps of information from him though, such as my mother was buried in Virginia where her people came from. I got worked up at that, thinking I'd found a grandmother. No, he tells me, my mother was an only child whose mother died ages ago. Naturally, once he stepped on a roach in the kitchen, he told me my mother had spent hours luring roaches out of the house with bits of marshmallow and trails of graham cracker crumbs that she was a lunatic when it came to saving bugs. The oddest things caused me to miss her, like training bras. Who was I going to ask about that? 
and who but my mother could have understood the magnitude of driving me to junior cheerleader tryouts? I can tell you for certain, T. Ray didn't grasp it. But you know when I missed her the most? The day I was 12 and woke up with a rose petal stain on my panties. I was so proud of that flower and didn't have a soul to show it to except Rosaline. Not long after that, I found a paper bag in the attic stapled at the top. Inside it, I found the last traces of my mother. There was a woman, a photograph of a woman, smirking in front of an old car, wearing a light-colored dress with padded shoulders. Her expression said, don't you dare take this picture. But she wanted it taken. You could see that. You could not believe the stories I saw in that picture, how she was waiting at the car fender for her love to come to her, and not too patiently. I laid the photograph beside my eighth grade picture, and examined every possible similarity. She was more or less missing a chin too, but even so, she was above average pretty, which offered me genuine hope for my future. The bag contained a pair of white cotton gloves, stained the color of age. When I pulled them out, I thought her very hands were inside here. I feel foolish about it now, but one time I stuffed the glove with cotton balls and held them through the night. The end-all mystery inside the bag was a small wooden picture of Mary, the mother of Jesus. I recognized her even though her skin was black, only a shade lighter than Rosaline's. It looked to me like somebody had cut the black Mary's picture from a book, glued it onto a sanded piece of wood about two inches across, and varnished it. On the back, an unknown hand had written, Tiburon, South Carolina. For two years now, I'd kept these things of hers inside a tin box, buried in the orchard. There was a special place out there in a long tunnel of trees nobody knew about, not even Rosaline. I'd started going there before I could tie my shoelaces. At first, it was just a spot to hide from T-Ray and his meanness, or from the memory of that afternoon when the gun went off. But later, I would slip out there, sometimes after T-Ray had gone to bed, just to lie under the trees and be peaceful. It was my plot of earth, my cubby hole. I'd placed her things inside the tin box and buried it out there late one night by flashlight, too scared to leave them hanging around in my room, even in the back of a drawer. I was afraid T-Ray might go up to the attic and discover her things were missing and turn my room upside down searching for them. I hated to think what he'd do to me if he found them hidden among my stuff. Now and then I'd go out there and dig up the box. I would lie on the ground with the trees folded over me, wearing her gloves, smiling at her photograph. I would study Tiburon, South Carolina, on the back of the Black Mary picture, the funny slant of the lettering, and wonder what sort of place it was. I'd looked it up on the map once, and it wasn't more than two hours away. Had my mother been there and bought this picture, I always promised myself one day, when I was grown up enough, I would take the bus over there. I wanted to go every place she had ever been. After my morning of capturing bees, I spent the afternoon in the peach stand out on the highway selling T. Ray's peaches. It was the loneliest summer job a girl could have, stuck in a roadside hut with three walls and a flat tin roof. I sat on a coke crate and watched pickups zoom by till I was nearly poisoned with exhaust fumes and boredom. Thursday afternoons were usually a big peach day, with women getting ready for Sunday cobblers, but not a soul stopped. T-Ray refused to let me bring books out here and read, and if I smuggled one out, say, Lost Horizon stuck under my shirt, somebody, like Mrs. Watson from the farm next door, would see him at church and say, Saw your girl in the peach stand reading up a storm. You must be proud. And he would half kill me. What kind of person is against reading? I think he believed it would stir up ideas of college, which he thought a waste of money for girls, even if they did, like me, score the highest number on a, a human being can get on their verbal aptitude test. Math aptitude is another thing, but people aren't meant to be overly bright in everything. I was the only student who didn't groan and carry on when Mrs. Henry assigned us another Shakespeare play. Well, actually, I did pretend to groan but inside I was as thrilled as if I'd been crowned Sylvan's Peach Queen. Up until Mrs. Henry came along, I'd believed beauty college would be the upper limit of my career. Once, studying her face, 
I told her if she was my customer, I would give her a French twist, and that would do wonders for her. And she said, and I quote, Please, Lily, you are insulting your fine intelligence. Do you have any idea how smart you are? You could be a professor or a writer with actual books to your credit. Beauty school. Please. It took me a month to get over the shock of having life possibilities. You know how adults love to ask, so what are you going to be when you grow up? I can't tell you how much I hated that question, but suddenly I was going around volunteering to people, people who didn't even know, people who didn't even want to know that I planned to be a professor and a writer of actual books. I kept a collection of my writings. For a while, everything I wrote had a horse in it. After we read Ralph Waldo Emerson in class, I wrote My Philosophy of Life, which I intended for the start of a book, but could only get three pages out of it. Mrs. Henry said I needed to live past 14 years old before I would have a philosophy. She said a scholarship was my only hope for a future and lent me her private books for the summer. Whenever I opened one, T. Ray said, Who do you think you are, Julius Shakespeare? The man sincerely thought that was Shakespeare's first name, and if you think I should have corrected him, you are ignorant about the art of survival. He also referred to me as Miss Brown Nose in a book, and occasionally as Miss Emily Bighead Diction. He meant Dickinson, but again, there are things you let go by. Without books in the peach stand, I often pass the time making up poems, but that slow afternoon, I didn't have the patience for rhyming words. I just sat out there and thought about how much I hated the peach stand, how completely and absolutely I hated it. The day before I'd gone to first grade, T. Ray had found me in the peach stand, sticking a nail into one of his peaches. He walked toward me with his thumbs jammed into his pockets and his eyes squinted half shut from the glare. I watched his shadow slide over the dirt and weeds and thought he had come to punish me from stabbing a peach. I didn't even know why I was doing it. Instead, he said, <clears throat> Lily, you're starting school tomorrow, so there are things you need to know about your mother. For a moment, everything got still and quiet as if the wind had died and birds had stopped flying. When he squatted down in front of me, I felt caught in the hot dark. I could not breathe free of it. It's time you knew what happened to her, and I want you to hear it from me, not from people out there talking. We had never spoken of this, and I felt a shiver pass over me. The memory of that day would come back to me at odd moments. The stuck window, the smell of her, the clink of hangers, the suitcase, the way they'd fought and shouted. Most of all, the gun on the floor, the heaviness when I'd lifted it. I knew that the explosion I'd heard that day had killed her. The sound still sneaked into my head once in a while and surprised me. Sometimes it seemed that when I'd held the gun, there hadn't been any noise at all, but it had come later. But other times, sitting alone on the back steps, bored and wishing for something to do, or pent up in my room on a rainy day, I felt I had caused it. That when I'd lifted the gun, the sound had torn through the room and gouged out our hearts. It was a secret knowledge that would slip up and overwhelm me, and I would take off running, even if it was raining out, I ran straight down the hill to my special place in the peach orchard. I'd lie right down on the ground and it would calm me. Now, T. Ray scooped up a handful of dirt and let it fall out of his hands. The day she died, she was cleaning out the closet, he said. I could not account for the strange tone of his voice, an unnatural sound, how it sounded almost, but not quite, kind cleaning the closet. I had never considered what she was doing those last moments of her life, why she was in the closet, and what they had fought about. I remember, I said. My voice sounded small and far away to me, like it was coming from an ant hole in the ground. His eyebrows lifted, and he brought his face closer to me. Only his eyes showed confusion. You what? I remember, I said again. You were yelling at each other. A tightening came into his face. Is that right? He said. His lips had started to turn pale, which was the thing I always watched for. I took a step backwards. 
God damn it, you were four years old, he shouted. You don't know what you remember. In the silence that followed, I considered lying to him, saying, I take it back. I don't remember anything. Tell me what happened. But there was such a powerful need in me, pent up for so long, to speak about it, to say the words. I looked down at my shoes, at the nail I'd dropped when I'd seen him coming. There was a gun. Christ, he said. He looked at me for a long time, then walked over to the bushel baskets stacked at the back of the stand. He stood there for a minute with his hands balled up before he turned around and came back. What else? He said. You tell me right now what you know. The gun was on the floor and you picked it up, he said. I guess you remember that. The exploding sound had started the echo around in my head. I looked off in the direction of the orchard, wanting to break and run. I remember picking it up, I said, but that's all. He leaned down and held me by the shoulders, gave me a little shake. You don't remember anything else? You're sure? Now think. I paused so long, he cocked his head, looking at me, suspicious. No, sir, that's all. Listen to me, he said his fingers squeezing into my arms. We were arguing like you said. We didn't see you at first. Then we turned around and you were standing there holding the gun. You'd picked it up off the floor. Then it just went off. He let me go and rammed his hands back into his pockets. I could hear his hands jingling keys and nickels and pennies. I wanted so much to grab onto his leg to feel him reach down and lift me to his chest, but I couldn't move and neither did he. He stared at a place over my head, a place he was being very careful to study. The police asked a lot of questions, but it was just one of those terrible things. You didn't mean to do it, he said softly, but if anybody wants to know, that's what happened. Then he left, walking back toward the house. He'd gone only a little way when he looked back, and don't stick that nail into my peaches again. It was 6 p.m. when I wandered back to the house from the peach stand, having sold nothing, not one peach, and found Rosaline in the living room. Usually she would have gone home by now, but she was wrestling with the rabbit ears on top of the TV, trying to fix the snow on the screen. President Johnson faded in and out, lost in the blizzard. I'd never seen Rosaline so interested in a TV show that she would exert physical energy over it. What happened? I asked. Did they drop the atom bomb? Ever since we'd started bomb drills at school, I couldn't help thinking my days were numbered. Everybody was putting fallout shelters in their backyard, canning tap water, getting ready for the end of time. Thirteen students in my class made fallout shelter models for their science project, which shows it was not just me worried about it. We were obsessed with Mr. Khrushchev and his missiles. No, the bomb hasn't gone off, she said. Just come here and see if you can fix the TV. Her fists were burrowed so deep into her hips they seemed to disappear. I twisted tinfoil around the antennae. Things cleared up enough to make out President Johnson taking a seat at a desk, people all around. I didn't care much for the president because of the way he held his beagles by the ears. I did admire his wife, Lady Bird, though, who always looked like she wanted nothing more than to sprout wings and fly away. Rosaline dragged the footstool in front of the set and sat down, so the whole thing vanished underneath her. She leaned towards the set, holding a piece of her skirt and winding it around her hands. What is going on? I said, but she was so caught up in whatever was happening, she didn't even answer me. On the screen, the president signed his name on a piece of paper, using about ten ink pens to get it done. Rosaline, shh, she said, waving her hand. I had to get the news from the TV man. Today, July 2nd, 1964, he said, the President of the United States signed the Civil Rights Act into law in the East Room of the White House. I looked over at Rosaline, who sat there shaking her head, mumbling, Lord have mercy, just looking so disbelieving and happy, like people on television when they answered the $64,000 question. I didn't know whether to be excited or worried for her. All people ever talked about after church were the black people and whether they'd get their civil rights. Who was winning? The white people's team 
or the black people's team, like it was a do or die contest. When that minister from Alabama, Reverend Martin Luther King, got arrested last month in Florida for wanting to eat in a restaurant, the men at church acted like the white people's team had won the pennant race. I knew they would not take this news lying down, not in one million years. Hallelujah, Jesus, Rosaline was saying over there on her stool, oblivious.